Certainly, the first time somebody mentioned spatial frequency to me, I had no idea at all what they were talking about. Let's think about temporal frequency. This is the time which has passed between two different occurrences of an event. So you might say, what's the frequency of the cars passing on the road? Well, then you would count the time between the cars passing you on the road. And if it was, we'll say, periodic, then you would be able to discuss the frequency of the cars passing you at a particular point on the road. In an analogous manner, spatial frequency is the length that has passed between the current two occurrences of the same thing. So basically, everything that you can see around you has some sort of spatial frequency. If you look at electricity pylons, for example, I'm going to, or let's say trees, say these, these things here represent trees, well then, these have a certain separation. In this case, I'm drawing them reasonably, reasonably periodic. So you would say that they have a certain spatial frequency. And in order to calculate the spatial frequency, of course, you would need the distance between two points, or in this case, two, two particular trees. Of course, you could, in this case, double the spatial frequency if you halved the distance between the trees. So let's say I'm going to draw a straight line rather than a tree. So what I'm drawing now would approximately have double the spatial frequency than this particular set of uh, objects. And finally, if we were to once again half the uh, space between but these objects are spaced, well, once again, we would be doubling the spatial frequency. So this set of objects has twice the spatial frequency of these set of objects, and this set of objects here has twice the spatial frequency of this set of objects. I find a good way to think about spatial frequency is in terms of the seats in a, let's say, a football stadium. The seats in a football stadium are all separated periodically. Let's say there is a, a centimetre or two between the seats. And you could say that there is a certain spatial frequency associated with the seats in your football stadium. And I'm sure at this point you're saying, well, well how does it do that? How does it change using uh, the Fourier transform to represent the function using cosines and sines and in the frequency domain? So I like to begin motivating this and later actually show why this is the case. The next question we must address is how does the Fourier transform work? In order to begin tackling this, I'd like to ask you, how would you work out how many cents are in one euro? Well, you would divide one euro by one cent and you would get 100 cent. How many eights are there, are, are there excuse me, in 64? You would divide 64 by eight and find out that there are eight eights in 64. How would you find out how many six hertz signals are there in your particular function, let's say, of time? Would you, for example, divide your function by six hertz? Now, I'm suggesting that that sort of operation is what gives you the Fourier transform. You're simply dividing your signal by the frequency components or your frequency basis vectors, frequency basis functions. And perhaps that's what's going to give us the Fourier transform. But how would we do that? How would we begin to divide a signal by a frequency? What does that even mean? Well, before I do that, I must do an important aside, and it's about Euler's formula. In this aside, we will see why in the Fourier transform integrals, it's equivalent to integrate a cosine, a single cosine, and a complex exponential e to the i theta. In order to do this, we require Euler's formula. I've derived Euler's formula in complex numbers, video three of four. So if you're not familiar with Euler's formula, that video is a place to begin or a good starting point. Euler's formula is stated here. We say that e to the i theta is equal to cosine theta plus i times the sine of theta, where i is equal to the square root of minus one. Now, the Fourier transform integrals involve two particular things. The first one is infinite but even integrals. Of course, they go from minus infinity to positive infinity. 
and they also involve products and sums of cosines and sines. Now, the products and sums of cosines and sines, using some clever trigonometric identities, can be written as a single cosine. So, as we will see later when we look at the derivation of the Fourier transform, instead of having four terms, namely two cosines multiplied together, added to two sines multiplied together, we can rewrite this as a single cosine of a minus b, let's say, or of course we can equivalently say that's cosine of theta. Now I said that there are two important parts of the Fourier transform integrals. The second part, or well, the first one that I mentioned, was the fact that the integrals themselves are even. Furthermore, we note that sine theta is an odd function. And inside an even integral, it will integrate to zero. So a moment ago, we saw that we are able to rewrite the products and sums of cosine and sine as a single cosine, which of course is in inside our infinite integral. Now because sine itself is an odd function and will integrate to zero, what would happen if we added anyway to the cosine i multiplied by sine theta and integrate it? Well, of course, that's going to be nothing else as integrating cosine theta. So it's equivalent to integrate cos theta plus i times sine theta and just simply cosine theta. I'm sure what you can see uh, coming, and namely we're going to invoke Euler's formula. So as I said, e to the i theta is equal to cos theta plus i times the sine of theta. This means that inside the Fourier transform integrals, we can go from having a single cosine or integrating our cosine to integrating e to the i theta. So when I say theta here, by the way, I really mean cosine a minus b, which came from having cos a and cos b and sine a sine b. Of course, once again, we will see that later on when we try and derive the Fourier transform proper. The reason it's useful to go from using the trigonometric function cosine to complex exponentials is that complex exponentials are very easy to manipulate. So the point here is that e to the i theta is both a cosine and a complex sine. However, inside the Fourier transform integrals, it integrates exactly as a cosine. So now it's time to go back to our question how many 6 hertz signals are there in our function f of t? Well, let's divide our function f of t by cosine of 6 hertz. Now, we saw a minute ago that cosine, in the, in, when you're using these uh, even infinite integrals, is the same as doing cosine 6t plus i times sine of 6t, because the sine is going to integrate to 0. So we just swap it and put in e to the i 6t. But we can bring this part of the expression above the line, provided we change the sign on the argument. So we have f of t multiplied by e to the minus i6t. So what that means is that f of t multiplied by e to the minus i6t is the same as dividing our function by cosine 6t in this particular case.